Welcome back to part two with our episode with Ace, the pet detective dentist who owns a group practice. Matt's shaking his head. I love it. And uh, we have here part two of our episode with Ace. If you didn't listen to part one, uh, please go back and listen to it. I think it was a fantastic interview. One of my favorites that I've done so far. Uh, every once in a while, I'll do an interview and I'll just like enjoy it way more than the guest or almost every interview. And uh, this one was this was probably one of my favorites that I did. Uh, he's such a cool guy and he's doing so well. I love the people that are doing well that, you know, we can still work on stuff. So that's always awesome. So this was a great interview. Uh, Matt, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, just some foreshadowing. You're going to, you completely changed this doc's outlook, which is so cool to see. Like, it's such a cool interview. And if you like organizational structure, which hand down, I don't, uh, you're going to love this one. Yeah, well, I, like, I think for me, like, you know, if you have a group practice, you need this. You need to build infrastructure in place that doesn't rely on you to handle the leadership. So, like, we talk about leadership on the show, but we don't talk about like leadership infrastructure. And once you get so big that you cannot do all the leadership yourself, you need to start delegating it. And so a lot of what we talk about in this episode is how Ace is going to delegate his leadership to his team and how he's going to select the right team members for each role. So it's really fun. It's totally different. I doubt we'll get another one like this again. But here we go with Practice Underwater with Ace. All right. Welcome back to Practice Underwater. We have part two with this is a good friend of mine, a mentor, uh, Dr. Ace. And uh, that's such a cool name. I can't get over it. I just texted him. I said, what name are you going to be? He said, Ace. And then I think I uh, I sent him back that gif of Ace Ventura. All in right, car. then. Yeah. And then like a glove. <laughs> you know, I do that. I say that all the time. Anyway, so um, we talked in part one and Ace came on and he has this huge like four and a half hygienist office, four front desk, 14 staff members in total. And they're about to do two million this year. And he's like, I want to make more money as a solo. And that's really what he came on saying. And by the way, listen to part one if you haven't. But if you didn't, I'm going to keep summarizing. And then he said, I want to make more money. So I want to simplify things. And I want to um, really be a solo dentist and make more than the $600,000 that I'm making now. And for me, you know, I was kind of confused about the situation. So the first thing we did was dispel the notion that as a solo, he would make more. And then the second thing we did was sort of walk him through his situation. And I was trying to figure out what the problem was. I couldn't really figure it out. And then um, it just had this awesome moment where he was like, well, um, I said, well, what is your, like, I was asking about the office manager because I, I, I guess it was just so obvious a thing to me that with 14 employees, you're going to have an office manager and he doesn't have an office manager. And so the second he said that, it became very apparent to me kind of what was really going on here. And it's Ace just has a practice that, you know, he feels overwhelmed with, but not from the costs of such a big practice. It's from the the ownership piece of the big practice because of a lack of proper infrastructure. And so he read the book Traction. And I think that kind of, did that plant the seed, Ace, that something is missing? Yeah, Traction was what really clarified it. I mean, I've read other more dental-specific books um on the topic but when you read about it from a more sober business perspective that's not just pertaining to dentistry when you realize there's fundamentals that you have to adhere to in order to scale in order to grow um yeah traction was the one that that, that put it all in place for me i mean i'd, I'd read several other of those those must must read like ultimate sales machine stuff like that but traction was the one that lays out the roadmap of, of where to go how to delegate how to appoint team leads and and how to really structure the thing to where it's not such a beast yeah 100 percent. and um you know traction for me was really the the wake-up call that i run my businesses. So the way I used to do meetings is I'd walk around the office with a sticky note and it would have an announcement on it. And I would tell every person in the office, whatever it was on the sticky note, and then throw it away. And that was George's meeting. And um, I hate meetings. I feel like they're a total waste of time. And now with traction, we do meetings, you know, every month. And um, I still don't do huddles, but that's okay. And um, <laughs> so, you know, but ultimately, yeah. So I think what we've really identified is that that feeling of like unwieldiness, like the, there was a reason why me mentioning going to 3 million sounded so exhausting to you. Like for me, I'm looking at your practice. I'm like, you have all the demand. You have high new patient flow without doing anything. Like, why are you so against growing? And it's just 
you know, a lack of infrastructure. So right. um, let's talk about, let's talk about that for a minute and um, identify. So you've identified some department leads. So do you have an office manager in place? Yes. Okay. Have you told that person yet? No. Okay. Do you have a, t- a lead hygienist? Yes. Okay. Do you have a lead assistant? No. Okay. Who does your supply ordering? Again, a holdover from the previous regime, but one of our hygienists does the oh, okay. supply ordering. I thought you were going to say you. And no, I was gonna lose no, it. no, no. It's not that bad. I was going to lose it. Uh, what is your <laughs> supply? What was your supply overhead right now? Do you know your percentage? It's it's between five and seven. When I get my report from my CPA every month, it's it's low compared to what the the industry norms are. Like it's not out of whack. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't start there. That's a pretty disruptive thing to start managing inventory and stuff. Ask me how I know. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so we use Zen Supplies, and we have like we we took out all of our cabinets, and we got all tip out bins now and everything. Um, so I'm Break I'm pretty proud blade. of it. Excellent. Yeah, we did. We we retrofit. I, I I'm gonna make like a, a thing about my practice, like a retrofit breakaway. Like you don't need to do a startup to have this cool <laughs> stuff. We have the carts in the rooms. We have specialty carts. We have tip out bins, and it was an acquisition, so it can happen. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so you don't have a lead assistant. No, that's been a source of contention talking to my lead front office person and my lead hygienist is that I don't feel that there's currently someone on staff that would fit the bill to be a lead assistant, which to me is symbolic of a leadership problem on my part because I haven't sought out someone that I feel like could be a good lead assistant. And I don't currently have someone that I feel has the characteristics to, to lead a group of people well without ego and without other accompanying problems. So describe to me the characteristics you look for in team leads. So your office manager, your hygiene lead, what do, what qualities do they have that you admire? They are focused. They are team oriented. They are, they exhibit qualities of ownership. They 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 act like they own it. They they have um, they they're self starters, and they are mature and magnanimous when acting with around other people. They don't they don't parade around any bit of control that they have. They they act in the best interest of the office. And they don't they don't have petty interactions with others. So if one of your hygienists with reappointments rates was low Mm -hmm. and you wanted another hygienist to go talk to that person about it, is that the person you appointed? Yes. Okay, good. If you have to create a perio protocol that outlines how ACEs practice treats perio, is that hygienist the person you want to design and be the person to ask questions about that perio protocol? That hygienist is the one that designed it, and we did roll it out, and we did implement it, and that's gone swimmingly. So yeah, is that swimmingly means swimmingly means we took the practice from having three percent of our hygiene be perio to like twelve to fifteen percent now. Perfect. So yeah, and um, the one thing that I will mention about perio percentage is that perio percentage will grow exponentially every six months because you've introduced all these new people into your perio program. And then every six months are going to come or every three months, they're come back more perio maintenance, perio maintenance, perio maintenance. So that percentile wise, your 13 to 15 might be on the lower side, but since you've had a rapid improvement, you know, you're realistically more like a 20 to 30 long-term stable perio percentage. Um, so just keep that in mind. But okay. anyway, um, so it seems like you've identified the right hygiene lead. Like to me, those are the important things are, can they like, you know, and ultimately, you know, taking that ownership burden off of you. So do you trust that person to make a decision without your involvement? hundred percent. Does that person make decisions without your involvement? Not right now. Okay. Now let's talk about the office manager. Okay. What is their current role in the practice? Treatment coordinator. This, this person predominantly is the one discussing uh, financing options, going over treatment. She's she's the one that is the boots on the ground as far as uh, enrolling patients in treatment. Okay. So describe to me, you have four front office. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, let's walk through each of their roles. Okay, we have treatment coordinator that does what I just described. Mm -hmm. We have a scheduler that is basically the hygiene coordinator Mm -hmm. because we've identified the attrition uh, slash inactive patients problem, and she's been tasked with doing a lot of practice by numbers reactivation. Mm -hmm. We have an insurance coordinator. Can I just say something real quick? Sure. So this hygiene coordinator right now, so Mm -hmm. you're booked out three to four weeks on the new patient side. Mm -hmm. And you also have just looked at practice by numbers and now your ass is on fire to fill a lot of, uh, so do you see where I'm going? Yeah. We need more hygiene capacity. So yes. And you doing the overdue hygiene calls right now is just making that problem worse. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, just know that, yeah, you need to, and one trick is in, so there are going to be moments in your life where you're too booked out in hygiene. That's a good problem to have. Call new patients first to move their appointments up as opposed to existing patients. Okay. Um, that way, new patients are the ones that are most eager to move up their appointments most, and it's the easiest way to fill overdue recare spots in or openings in hygiene. Okay. So that way you're bringing that one month to potentially you can shrink it down in the interim. Got it. Um, anyway, so you have your hygiene coordinator and now you have your insurance coordinator. Yeah. So, yeah, there's the treatment coordinator, hygiene coordinator, insurance coordinator, and then the patient greeter slash receptionist slash person that sits at the, at the front office counter to, to greet everyone. And then she also schedules, uh, verifies insurance, confirms appointments. Okay. Yeah. And then who does, what does the insurance coordinator do? Uh, follows up with unpaid claims does our submissions, does as much of the insurance pre-verification as possible, but she delegates some of that uh, to others as they have time to help. Okay. And uh, what is your total staff overhead? It hovers, excluding my associate, it's around 25% month in, month out. So... Can I throw a curveball? Please. So you're doing, I thought you were going to make this mistake with your hygiene team. You nailed the hygiene team. So oftentimes the lead of the team is not the best player. So your best player is your treatment coordinator. The reason why your associate and you have 82, 83% case acceptance is your treatment coordinator. So removing them from that position and putting them in a management role puts a lot of pressure on who goes into that position to get that same result. Do you trust your treatment coordinator to train another treatment coordinator to be as good as she is? Yes, but like you said, can you capture lightning on a bottle twice? Mm -hmm. So I, I would argue that that is the one person you cannot make an office manager okay. because an office manager is somebody that has to have a full-time job that does not require day-to-day operations, day-to-day like front desk, like operations. Okay. That's a good point of clarification because in all the practices I've ever worked in, the office manager has had subtle differences in their roles. Meaning I've seen office managers do different lists of tasks every day, depending on what the practice needed from them. So that's where, yeah, well, in, in your office manager's day-to-day, what does your office manager do day in, day out, if they're, if they're not presenting treatment to patients, if they're not having those interactions? So my office manager is in charge of the, so the one thing I monitor closely is adjustments, write-offs, and that type of thing. So she is the numbers person that goes through that and make sure that my collections is as high as possible. And so her only day-to-day operation is posting payments, adjusting insurance, and monitoring denials so that we can see where is our process breaking down. So in my practice, we are big on verification. And so we verify insurance, we place that in front of the clinician, and we say fluoride eligible. 
So our hygienist knows that that patient has adult fluoride coverage and they are going to offer fluoride for free. And then they're going to put on fluoride for free. And if that fluoride gets denied, that's a problem. So then my office manager will go in. And so she is the person that sort of has her, like which insurances are paying for panos, bite wings, and PAs versus which ones are not. Those are the types of things that my office manager, I want her boots to the ground on. I want her knowing that. And then, so that's like her one day-to-day function is uh, posting payments in charge of, you know, kind of monitoring the whole insurance process. That is her day-to-day. And the rest of it is whatever the practice needs. You have 14 employees, that's a full-time job. You know, right now there needs to be an add up and you need to be looking at resumes of future hygienists. That needs to be done. Payroll needs to be done. Holidays coming up. Who's working? Who's not? What days are you open? What days are you closed? That's a full-time job. Like there's a lot of things that managing a practice of this size and then blanks reappointment rate is down. I need to go talk to the hygiene team lead and have them go talk to that employee. You know, that's a full-time job. So pretty much it's a combination of all the things that are not getting done and the things you are doing with some things that are getting neglected. Right. You have a position to add. You don't have a position to reposition. Your staff overhead should not be 25%. Too low. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is a, uh, yeah, I know. We're both Justin Short clients. And, uh, you know, we were taught 20% staff overhead or die. And, uh, you know, I'm telling you the exact opposite. I'm telling you that 25% is why this does not feel sustainable. That makes sense. Makes my head hurt, but it makes sense. Well, realistically, what is, you know, $5,000 a month really going to do for you? In terms of an expense, it's not going to change your life a whole lot. Well, if the right person, it would make my life easier. Yes. And your practice will grow because you'll have an extra hygienist that you need. You know what I mean? So it's the idea that your practice right now needs to grow and it needs to be more organized. And so, so I would say I would look at that insurance coordinator or I would look at, um, hiring from the outside. Somebody that's been an office manager, somebody that you feel can talk to each employee and correct them if they need to be discussed. Like if somebody is not doing what they're supposed to do right now, you're having that conversation. Yeah. So right now I'm not having that conversation. Only in, only in certain instances am I having that conversation. Right. So those are all the things that make your life feel hard as an owner of this 14 employee practice. When the only person you should be in charge of is your office manager and your associate. Right. When so when you read traction and in traction they they break up, you have like the person that's the the ideas guy or, or the yeah or the visionary and the integrator yeah exactly you have the visionary the integrator and mm-hmm. we we typically have to be both unless unless we're absentee owners you don't have to be so you but, are the visionary right and office manager is the integrator okay and then beyond that they divide it up into sales and marketing operations and financials Mm -hmm. so you would still recommend dividing up the the team leads based on departments assistant hygienist front office rather Mm -hmm. than taking it in the broad business sense of traction you just keep it simple realistically this is a this is a business of two makes of making money hygiene production and doctor production right so you know yeah i mean you are hygiene assistants front desk and um, marketing. Those are your branches. Okay. And you need a marketing coordinator. Yes. So your office manager would be that marketing coordinator. Makes sense. So again, something that's not getting done that needs to get done. So your office manager is in charge of making sure everyone is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if they're not, the proper person is getting talked to and that whole situation is getting executed well. And the way she knows that stuff is practiced by numbers. I mean, that's, I'm not like an ad here. That's just like the truth. You go look at the metric. If the, if blanks hygiene reappointment rate is down, you go talk to them. If blanks fluoride sucks, you go talk to them. You know, it, it just, you just, so then all of a sudden, all of this stress that you feel 
is not stress. It's infrastructure that you create to handle it. So, you know, right now, like, is there anybody in your office that is in charge of making sure that you're not too booked out on the, on the hygiene side? I've been monitoring that. Yeah. You've been, but not, that. but not well enough, obviously. Like in my practice, you know, my hyg- my office manager and my scheduling coordinator know, you know, we have a we have a formula that we use to determine how much hygiene we need the next month. Mm-hmm. And they know those numbers. And they make those decisions without me. Because if I make those decisions, I over open hygiene because I want to grow as fast as possible and they don't like that. So right. um, well it's like you said before, you'd rather have a hygienist see three patients a day because that at least breaks even and that allows you to treatment plan on those patients that come in rather than being booked out too far and not having enough hygiene coverage. So I have coined, this is an original thought that I have um, and uh, you haven't gotten to the episodes yet, but I give somebody a hard time for, for calling themselves an original thought leader. So I am the original thought leader on the metric that does not exist in PBN that we calculate, which is treatment accepted per hygiene exam. And um, so I am at about $250 of treatment accepted per hygiene exam. So for me, that hygiene exam has an additional value of $250 in my practice, in my hands. So yeah, I mean, that's a real thing. So how much do you pay a hygienist per day? Like $250, somewhere in there. So I don't know what that metric is for you, but your case acceptance numbers look better than mine. So one exam, one patient, you paid for that hygienist. There you go. The the hygiene openings are killing your practice thing is total bullshit. Yeah. I, whoever thought of that is, is really stupid. Um, so anyway, that's that's my uh, totally condescending comment of the episode. So, but I, I think just in general, like think of the things that your your practice needs to run the way you want it to and build that into that position. So opening up a new position gives you the freedom to design it the way you want to and bring somebody in and say, here, do this thing that I've designed perfectly for my practice. It's a beautiful thing. Did you hire your office manager from without or was it someone that you inherited when you bought the practice? So I inherited somebody called the office manager who was an insurance coordinator. So it has been, and this is very much an active process of, you know, working with that person and coaching them. And, you know, at this point, you know, just letting them grow into that role of being an office manager and getting out of the way. Okay. But that's contingent upon having the right person in place to do Correct. that. And, yeah. you know, again, I would look, so it's really hard because, you know, if you are going to hire somebody from the outside, which is, is a bold move because you're bringing in like this whole unknown entity. And so the way I would position that, let's just say you decide to do it because you're probably worried about how my whole team would react. Yeah. You would just say, I'm overwhelmed. And I just, I feel like we have a great cohesion as a unit. We don't have anybody extra. We'd need to hire somebody. And so I want to hire somebody who's done this before because I've never done this. And so I want you guys to all be involved in the hiring process. Mm -hmm. I would want your whole team to be involved on hiring an office manager. I would not want you to hire an office manager and then just introduce them to the team because then the team didn't pick who is leading them. Having your team pick who leads will go a long way for the effectiveness of the leader. Okay. That's a tough nut to crack because it would be the easiest to sort of promote someone from within. It would be the easiest thing, but... You have to have the right person, the right qualifications, the right viewpoint. So I'm going to push back on that one. Okay. Grass is greener on the other side. I'm telling you that you need to hire from the outside. And you're telling me, well, it'd be easier if I could just promote. But so in my practice, I kind of promoted because they were called the office manager, but they weren't. And I brought them into an office manager role. Now you have two people that used to be teammates who are now telling each other what to do. Yeah. That's not easy. Okay. So you have a different challenge, neither easier nor harder. It's just, and both are fine, but both have challenges. Not one is easier. It's just who is the proper office manager? Is it somebody you hire or is it somebody you promote? Um, Both are difficult, but both are necessary. And so 
it's very rare that you have a practice that can support an office manager that has the ability to hire one. I would not take that opportunity for granted. Okay. Try to get the right one. That would be so much better for your practice than promoting the wrong one to avoid hiring somebody. Got it. So hiring somebody is one option. Promoting is another. Do you feel like there's anybody in your team that could that could be promoted into that position? Just the all-star that presents the treatment. But like you said, you don't want to kill the golden goose, right? You know? Yeah, that's a super, super well-performing position right now in your practice. Yeah. Um, that would be like taking your best hygienist and saying, all right, you are going to be in a totally non-clinical position. Yeah. And uh, now you you train a new hygienist on how to be as good as you. Right. Fluoride perio go down. So what I was going to say was you hired an associate and you introduced them to your team as somebody superior to the team, right? They're not like the owner, but they're, you know, what they say goes in certain situations and, you know, that that's part of it. It would be very similar to that with an office manager. So we're hiring an office manager, somebody to lead the team, and they're kind of brought in at that level of almost an associate, you know, so. um, That happens in every other business. Like every other business has hierarchies, middle management everything else this should be no different and so you just need to your team needs to be on board for why right and that treatment coordinator that's an all-star can be front office lead right that is a worthy title and they are the person in charge of you know the the day-to-day and reporting back to the office manager on all front office related things but they are not the office manager so they are not doing anything different on the day-to-day basis but those qualities that you like about that person can still be and that person can still be recognized as a superior and like all the things that you're wanting to promote that person for so you don't have to um totally dismiss them as just like everybody else but making them the office manager like we've discussed would be uh would be detrimental to the case acceptance of your practice right i agree okay so now like the idea of split shifting and changing everybody's hours and doing all this stuff that makes your head hurt right now, right? Right now. But I know that that's the way to, to soldier on forward. Like you have to do that. And that's the office manager's job, okay. right? Their, your job is to tell them we're split shifting, figure it out. And it's their job to be the integrator and figure it out. So that's where I'm not saying do that tomorrow or the first thing you give your office manager to do, but like that's the that's the benefit that you can have as an office manager or having an office manager is going up to them and saying, this is what I want done as the visionary. I want to add a hygienist and a doctor and this and that. Now make it happen, you know? Got it. Okay. So now two things I want to talk about that we haven't yet. So assistance. What's going on with your assistance, man? They are assistants, I think, are just a different breed in a lot of cases where the the personalities can be all over the map. You can have some of the most humble, hardworking, nose to the grindstone type people, and you can also have some very emotionally all over the place type personalities that can be hard to wrangle in. And in my office, I don't have one pristine, shining example of the former, of the the low-key, hardworking, uh, easy to get along with type person. They're they're all they all have their their personality quirks, none of whom I think would be cut out for a leadership role as badly as I know I need someone in a leadership role. And I think this might be a situation where I could hire from without and bring someone in and have them be elevated to, to do that potentially. So it's funny. I'm going to push back on you on that one. I'm excited. Um, so somebody has a question with how to work uh, the handpiece in a certain room. Yeah. Who are they asking? Is there a certain employee my, that they would ask? My primary assistant. The, okay. The, the most. Somebody wants to know how to do something in the practice management software that is difficult. Who are they asking? One of the uh, front office staff that that runs okay. software the most. What about how to um, think of like what what types of questions are assistants asking each other, and who are they asking? 
the, yeah, there's one person that's like the font of all knowledge in yes. practice. Yeah, the, who's been there the longest, who runs the intraoral scanner, who yeah knows how to take the cone beams the best. I mean, yeah, there's there's one person. Yeah. So why are they not the lead? She's a head case. Okay, in what way? Emotional, unpredictable, petty. A good a good chairside assistant, like in a vacuum, great chairside assistant. In in her natural habitat at the office, combustible. So it's that staff member that everybody wants you to fire because she is uh, disruptive to the culture, but you can never do it because she's so good at what she does. In a, in a way, she's good at what she does. I wouldn't say she's disruptive to the culture, but you have to walk on eggshells somewhat around her. And I felt like I needed her at the outset, right when I took over. And now I know that I could get by without her, but she is a good person. She's just like a 12 year old girl in interacting with her. Very emotionally tumultuous. Okay. That's not describing a lead assistant to me. No, not at all. <laughs> so, That's why not. All of the qualities of a lead assistant are that person. Yeah. Except for the um the fact that she so so what would she struggle with that a lead assistant would need to do? She would struggle with having power, with having any type of um responsibility over others, ability to instruct others. I don't think she could handle that very well. But what about another assistant instructing her? Yeah, that would not go over well either. Because like, in my mind, if she's in the office, she would have to be, if there's a lead assistant, it would have to be her or else all hell would break loose. And then she might quit and then things might be better, you know? So um, this is one that, so there's no right answer to this one. No. Um, but in general, a department lead is mm -hmm. not, so an office manager is different than a department lead. So a department lead is not something I would go hire out because okay. that's like very practice specific knowledge or, um, you know, and so that's how we do it at this practice at ACES practice. How is this done? Yeah. And so that is typically, um, and I know I just sounded like I contradicted myself with the office manager piece, um, but the office manager is such a unique position in that they're really running the practice. And you want somebody that has experience with that and can talk to all employees and be in charge of all departments. And so that might not be on your team. But department leads is a little bit different because you're you're looking for somebody who understands your practice well, can communicate well with the other team members on that team. And so um, it seems like you kind of are at a crossroads on how you could handle that assistant lead. You either give it to the assistant that it's, and I agree that, it would be difficult for that assistant to receive leadership from another assistant, no matter who that is, because they feel like they're the best. Yep. And is there, is there another assistant on your team who would be really good at like you hire a new person? So like, let's just say hiring, for example, you're going to hire a new assistant, mm -hmm. which of, do you have an assistant in mind that you would trust best to judge the applicant? Yes. Is it that same assistant that we're talking about? No. Okay. Describe this assistant that you said yes to. Currently, you're, you're going to love this. This is like the, the office manager thing all over again. You're, you're going to love it. She was my she was my lead assistant at another job, but when I hired her, I hired her for a front office position because that's where I had a need, and she'd worked front office before. But she's a great assistant. But right now, she is front office. What is for, she doing in the front office? She's the receptionist, greeter, face of the practice scheduling plugged in wherever we need her to be. So your best assistant that you've had at your other job huh. is currently not an assistant, but she's about to be because I've got another one going on maternity leave. It's like a big jigsaw puzzle. The one that goes on maternity leave leaves in a month. This one that's really good is going to come to the back in a month. And How long has she been at your practice for? She's been here for five months. Okay, so not terribly long time. Okay, continue. She's still new. And so my long-term plan is get her in the back with me and then 
slowly shift the balance of power away from the the temperamental one that's currently my de facto primary assistant. And then I can make a change if I need to and then designate this other assistant as as the lead ultimately. So you have here um you have two so you have this is this is the right person wrong seat from traction. Yes. Exactly. Exactly, yes. So right person is this assistant that you have sitting at the front desk greeting people in the wrong seat. In the wrong seat, like literally yep. in the wrong chair. She needs to be in the assistant's chair in the back. Yes. And you have the wrong person in the in in the in, right seat. In a right seat, yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is where you got to put on your big boy pants and do what is best for the practice. Yeah, I agree. Which is right person, right seat. Yep. And it's a difficult conversation that you have to have with that um, that other assistant. It is your hope that they can slide into 1B. Mm-hmm. It is your hope that they can slide into 1B. If they cannot slide into 1B, then they're gone. Yeah. Right person, right seat. That's not negotiable. Okay. I knew the answer was there. I just didn't know they were sitting at the front desk. You did. You're right. <laughs> so, um, but so now let me, let me give you a little bit of coaching on how I would handle that conversation. Okay. Because for me, this is where like we talked about Matt's special sauce in part one. This is totally my special sauce. Like my ability to manicure the staff stuff is like, honestly, it's, it's the stuff that gets me the most excited. And so setting that assistant down and outlining to them and just say, look, like, I love working with you. Um, I don't want to do this this way or, you know, but you say like, look, you're my best assistant and I don't want you to leave. Um, but it just, at times the practice just needs a person with a little bit, you know, and you kind of manicure that language a little bit. I don't know exactly what it is, but the practice needs somebody who can talk to all assistants and who they can receive stuff from well. And so I have to anoint a lead assistant. And while it would be most natural that it's you, in this case, I feel like it's best for the practice if it's X. And just say, it doesn't mean that I think X is a better assistant than you. It just means that for the roles and the responsibilities on the administrative side, I think X is a little bit better suited to handle them. But I don't think that they're a better assistant than you. Like assistants get really competitive about who's the best assistant. And so if you make sure to let them know that they might be the best player on the team, but doesn't mean you're the captain. Like, I think you have to, I, I kind of, I kind of call it Revis Island. Are you a football fan? Yeah. So this, this temperamental assistant is, you know, like Darrell Revis, Stefan Gilmore type corner. You just put them on the best receiver and you, you just got your man. That's not like a team sport though. That's just being really good at what you do individually. Yeah. So this assistant is Revis Island. You know, like They're, a run or test type where yeah. head- complete psychopath but really really good lockdown defender exactly so you put them on that's your best assistant you know and i bet i i bet that is your best assistant yeah. chair side best assistant so biggest cases you know they can still be your primary assistant they don't have to be the lead so if they stay as like dr aces owner docs primary assistant that to them is like a, a title you know it's not like a title but it is it has it has prestige yeah. and then this other person can be associates lead assistant and then associate gets this person and that person is the lead assistant for the entire office. So you just got to make it very clear. And that is a difficult ownership conversation to have. Like for me, my chest gets tight with that type of stuff. Like that's the sign of my body gives me with anxiety is like anytime I know I'm in the right place and I'm doing the thing that makes me uncomfortable, chest gets tight. You know, so I don't know where you feel that in your body, but my guess is before that conversation and even talking about that conversation is making you uncomfortable. Yeah. And um, But that's how we get better. Got to lean into it. Yeah, you got to lean into that. So um, that conversation is one that is going to be pivotal to like, you know, text me after you do that. And if you're able to pull that off, like that's level five leadership. You know, that that's there. Good to that's great. tough. Yeah, that that that's that's what makes that's the pivotal moment where your practice takes off because you have the right people in the right seats. You got your hygiene lead, you got your front office lead, you got your assistant lead, and you got your office manager. Now you're ready to go. So 
like your departments need to be set up in a way that they run their departments and they report problems back to the office manager. Your office manager is the one that runs your meetings. You do not run meetings. That sounds good. Right? Now it's sounding nice. Before this was sounding unwielding. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, so you're at a practice. So let, let's kind of like, we're kind of wrapping up here, but you know, let's, let's take a step back here and, and think about it. You know, you came in with this issue of not being able to run a practice of the size that you have it. And, you know, now we've put one hire in place and repurposing your additional staff and we've set up an infrastructure where the practice can run without you. Once it can run without you, it doesn't need you to be there all the time. Like you're talking about the necessity to treatment plan for associates. Like that's the furthest thing from your problem. Your problem is uh, the practice, like you can leave for four weeks and nobody cares. Yeah. Like uh, Paul Etchison is somebody that I look up to a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, he has his leadership team in his practice and they kind of joke around with him. Like we're like, they just do meetings without him now because he's like always late and they don't care. They don't need him anymore. And yeah. um, he's he like, I built this whole thing. ACL and he doesn't even have to work for a while. Like he's, yeah. He's been out for a minute with an injury. And yeah. It didn't even matter. And the practice is chugging and he still deposits money from his business checking to his personal checking. And, you know, it just happens well. And, you know, that's what you need. Uh -huh. Um you know, you don't need to reinvent the associate chip treatment planning philosophy system that's going to make you millions of dollars. You know, you just need to inf get some infrastructure in your practice so that it can run itself um, so that you can afford to get as big as you need to be. Well, it's reassuring to hear that because you, you it's like you said earlier, the grass is always greener. You, you hear what someone else has built or the way someone else has structured their practice and you think, oh, that sounds way easier, better, faster, faster more desirable but you said earlier like hey it's the practice you bought it's the practice i bought like when you acquire a practice you acquire that foundation and you'd be yeah. idiotic to to do something that flies in the face of that so i can tell you every solo has moments where they're jealous of a group practice owner you know when you like for me and you like when I get stuck with like a $10,000 bill, I don't, the thing that does not pop in my head is I have to produce $10,000 to pay this. Does that pop into your head? No. Yeah. All the solo dentists listening right now are like, fuck you, dude. That was just 10 crowns that I just had to prep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Probably should bleep out that F word, but yeah. you know, um, yeah, we'll see. So, <laughs> but the reality is that like grass is always green on this side. You bought a practice that is a group practice. You got 4,000 patients. Like you're, you are twice as big as the largest solo practice ever, you know? So like you need to own that. Like I am a group practice. I'm going to be the best version of my practice, not make this Macarino's office. This is not Macarino's office. Right. Well, no, so I think we've solved the identity crisis. <laughs> so how do you feel man i feel a whole lot better a whole lot more focused um i've actually got a meeting with the people that i have designated to be on the leadership team tomorrow and this this will give me some ammunition to go in with for sure Good. and so you did not tell that team treatment coordinator that they're the office manager right no not yet no and i think the only thing i would look at is that insurance coordinator and um only if they're like an exceptional person. Uh, but I would really look at hiring an office manager. That's what I'll do. Honestly, maybe even somebody, and this could be a little crazy, but maybe even somebody without dental experience. Okay. Well, because based on what you told me that needed to be in the, in the job description, very little of that was dental specific. I mean, if they have medical experience with insurance issues, juggling all that, it doesn't ha I mean, you can learn the dental skills. Yeah. It's the people skills that you need in your practice. Yeah. So I, I like send them to breakaway. I sent my office manager and my front desk. I bought my practice with two of them. So mm -hmm. two front desk. I sent them to the office manager mastery course. I know you went to breakaway and really enjoyed it. Yeah. So if you hired a non dental specific manager and somebody with great management skills and people skills and um, your staff loves them and you sent them to 
your um, office manager mastery course. And then uh, your staff, you have department leads. So those are the people that are responsible for training that manager on dental specific things. Like, And there's a training piece to that, but you could probably get them at a big discount compared right. to hiring a dental specific. But I would look at both. Look at dental specific, look at non-dental specific. What's going to give you the ROI on that position is the growth of your practice when it needs to happen, hiring the right people. You know, and so like, let's talk about hiring. You need to hire a hygienist. So let's just say you had a non-dental specific office manager in place. Like that person puts up an ad and gets a, uh, you know, gets resumes in the mail, looks at them with the team lead and interviews them with the team lead. The hygiene lead is looking at hygiene specific things and the office manager is looking at employee conflict specific things. Like you got a two headed snake that's going to make really good hires. I love it. So, um, like, and I, I'm only saying that because I know you're in an area where it might be hard to find an office manager with dental experience. Right. You're not in like this budding metropolitan area like I am where I could get a lot of office managers potentially. Uh, yeah. So you might need somebody with management experience, not dental specific. Okay. Okay. So what is your review? Fan of Prax Underwater? Oh, for sure. It's it's amazing. I mean, that that completely changed my outlook hearing the getting on the, the George psychiatrist couch like that helped immensely. <laughs> I love doing it. It's awesome. Um, yeah. So I, I just, I love, I, I, I couldn't take you seriously for a minute when you were talking about the solo <laughs> dentist thing. I was like, is this guy serious dude? Like, is he really trying? Like, yeah. Like you guys did 17 K today. There's no way you're doing 17 K without, uh, without two dentists. Well, you become a prisoner of the moment, and you you hear about other other ways of doing it, and other uh, every other people's problems seem better than your own problems sometimes. Yeah. But no, you're you're right. I just needed to have my my head shaken a little bit. I will brag for a minute. This month, I did have two seventeen k days as a solo, but what? Um, that does not happen ever. Damn. It just happened to be happened to be implants help, right? Yeah, oh yeah, big time. Those were both implant days. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, I really enjoyed this interview, Ace. And this is a cool one for our audience because this is probably not one they're going to see again or very often, you know, somebody with, and I think that goes back to the ladder like mentality that we talk about where like, it'll be better when it'll be better when, and I can imagine you walked into practice ownership saying, if I was doing $2 million a year, making 600 K working four days a week, that'll be better when, Yeah. and you came on here not feeling that way. Right, but it's it's all about perspective and being grateful for the journey, like being yeah. grateful for where you are and understand that it's it's the the trip, not not the destination. Cool, and I love this. I'm going to chat with you a little bit off air, but I really enjoyed this, man. It was great having you on, Ace. Cool, thanks, George. I hope you guys enjoyed the interview as much as I did. I had a lot of fun recording it, and uh, Matt's got some good stuff for us. You know, this isn't his this isn't his area of, and he'll he'll be the first one to say it. This is totally my area. Um, but Matt, what were your thoughts on that? Well, it was an extremely valuable episode for our listeners. Sure. You know, as little our listeners, not so much valuable for me personally, but that's fine. You know, we need these kind of things. This was a, this is a needed practice underwater episode. Like you said, not something we'll probably ever have again. So super cool to have. You did awesome. Um, we talk a lot about special sauce on here, you know, between you and I and, and others. You, your special sauce for this one shown through big time. Um when you went through that conversation he was going to have with the assistant, why she was like a great assistant, but not the head assistant for these reasons, like there's the words you used and like how you explained it. Like I was, I was going into it thinking like, Oh, she's like really going to hate this and like not respond well. And then like the sample frame of like how you framed it. It's like, Oh, that makes total sense. I'm like, she's totally going to get that. So like, I just wanted to point that out. Like it was incredible. Um, and we talk a lot about, um, you know, the uncomfortable conversation thing. And like, that's, that's you, like you crush those. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it's nice to acknowledge, you know, um, yeah, we've, we talk a lot about, especially in solo episodes, like Matt's, Matt's ability to do certain things. And, you know, I don't do those things well and I, I own it and I try to work on them, but like, this is what I do really, really well is I empower my team and like, I felt like, and I'm super excited for uh, my hygiene lead. She listens to the show. I'm super excited for her to listen to this episode because um, I'm just really proud of my team. Like, I think listening to this episode, not saying Ace's team sucks, they don't, they're great. But, you know, just like the work that we've done as a team 
and the growth, like the biggest asset in my practice is the team. And it's ultimately, you know, I mean, the, the leader of the team, which ultimately everything starts and ends with me is the ability to develop them into the roles that they're in and kind of work with them and coach them as they're going through those moments and the uncomfortable conversations that have to happen. You know, all of that stuff is so the thing I really enjoy about ownership. Like what's the thing I enjoy the most? It's team member crying in my office because they're struggling with something that I'm trying to get them to do. Like that's so much fun. Um, and like Matt's laughing. I don't laughing. think there's anyone else out there who would say that those words. <laughs> no, like, you know, that's a moment. That's like a growing moment with you and that team member and you're working through something together. Like, oh gosh, I love that, you know? Yeah, and I love the remember. coaching moments. And like, they don't have to be crying, right? Like the crying is an exaggerated situation, but like, they're like, hey, I'm really struggling with this. And, you know, like a lot of growth with like, you know, each one of my employees in certain ways has really grown. And to be there to facilitate that growth with them and coaching them and helping them become, you know, the best version of themselves is the thing that I enjoyed the most about practice ownership. And, um, you know, so this was very much a fun episode for me. And I think that conversation with the assistant, like, whew, like that one, I don't want to have either. Like that, that's a conversation, you know, and, um, I, you know, you got to wordsmith it the right way. Definitely. You got to always make them feel valued and never want it to feel like a demotion. And, you know, that's why it was important that she stays with Ace as his primary assistant. Um, but at the same time, you have to put the right person in the wrong seat. And um, it's funny because I was like, I feel like your assistant lead is somewhere in the office. And he's like, yeah, they're at the front desk. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, that makes no sense. But, um, you know, it was quite figuratively right person, wrong seat. Like, it was kind of funny. But yeah. um, And I want to talk about, too, how you made another brilliant point about the treatment coordinator, that she's so good and extraordinary in her job that making her an OM is probably not the right move, even though she's the most rock star employee. You mentioned the Darrell Rivas uh, Gilmore comment, which was, you know, of course, a play to my heart being a diehard Patriots fan. So thank you for that. I totally got it. Um, but I had another analogy. Like, it's like a, if anyone's a baseball fan out there and you have this like lefty reliever and he's just amazing against lefties, like crushes them, gets them out every time. But then the closer role opens up and you need someone to close games. And then do you put that lefty out there? He's an amazing relief pitcher. But then his special sauce is that like getting lefties out in a tough seventh, eighth inning. And maybe you don't want to make him that closer. Maybe you want to put someone else in. So similar to this, like there, she's so good at what she's doing that taking her out and putting her in a more of a management role is not playing to her strengths. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, I don't think, I don't think we're going to run into that very often where we have a team like he has, where it just felt like everyone was in the right spot and we didn't have anybody to promote. Normally you'll have somebody to promote, but in his case, it just felt like everyone was in the right spot and he wanted to take like the most essential team ever he has and like take them out of that role that they really shine in. And, um, you know, like she's a great, she'll be a great front desk lead. And, um, you know, I think like your star employees, like, you know, a lot of times your lead, if they have good skills, uh, dealing with other employees, but you know, your, your ability to like really recognize who is the right person for each spot is, is going to make or break your ability to really have the type of leadership structure that's powerful. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just so proud of this guy. Like I, I just like, I know how much he's invested in this practice, both like monetarily and time wise and thought wise, like how much he cares and to like now be armed with this knowledge from you and that it's new outlook. It's like, the sky's the limit. Like, this is so cool. I'm so excited for him. You know, and like, I, t I think I took him through it in the episode, but like, I think right when, right when we did the episode, we had just hired a hygienist and it was the first time that we kind of tried out our new infrastructure where my office manager and hygiene lead and hygiene team, like they all did it without me, you know? And once your team starts being able to make major decisions without you, that's when the practice takes off because they have a system for recognizing it. Like in our practice, we have a way of recognizing when we need to add or take away hygiene days. Like we have that system in place and it doesn't involve me. And then we have a way of, you know, then either opening days or like we have that's all done without me and I'm not involved in that process. So it actually happens. But if it's reliable on you, the owner, who's also a dentist, who's working and doing other things, like it's not going to happen. You're going to sit there for months being overbooked in hygiene like he is. And, um, you know, now he's like pushing the reactivation hard, but he's also way booked out in hygiene. So it's like, you know, not, you know, he, he needs to have the infrastructure in place to make the proper ownership decisions for him and not have him do it. Th that was so funny that you that your staff is like, no, we're doing this. Like you're gonna add hygiene too mo too fast and too quick. Like we we got this. Yeah, they took it out of my hands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because yeah, that's my ta like I'm a super aggressive person, and um, the aggressive things that affect them 
uh, I think I, I recognized my weakness in, you know, my, maybe I'm too aggressive. And so now we have a formula that we've all agreed upon and they execute it without my involvement because that's an area that I tend to over, overdo. <laughs> I just love that. I don't know why it makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, they all know. Like if, if we leave it up to George, he's going to overdo hygiene openings, yeah. you know, and we don't do yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, so this was cool. Like this isn't like we get a lot of new owners on here. This is one who's, you know, been for what, two years about uh, um, a year more than me. So like two and a half. Yeah. Probably. But he's so like advanced in his development. You know, he's like, his team is already pretty solid. His numbers are good. Like he's just taking like steps like five to seven, you know, he's, it's cool. Like I like how we get a lot of different um, trajectories. Spectrum. Yeah. Spectrum, that's it. Uh, of ownership. Anyway. This is like a cool one. We haven't seen this one yet. Well, and I think like, I want to make a point and maybe this isn't like super nice to him, but the guy's got 4,000 patients doing $2 million a year. Like, you know, that's, yeah, I, I didn't want to say it. So thanks for saying that. Yeah. I mean, like, that is a lot of operational inefficiency and a lot of it has to do with a lack of infrastructure. Um, you know, Matt's practice is at like a thousand dollars a patient. Mine's at like $800 a patient. So like maybe I'm at more like close to 900, but yeah, I mean like my practice isn't that much smaller than his in collections, but we have about half as many patients, you know? So it's, I mean, we, I just crossed 1400 patients. Yeah. You know, so the fact that he has this many um, breeds to that just like, if the infrastructure was in place, then they would be able to grow appropriately. Like they're at capacity right now. Like they can't go anymore, but they have so many patients, you know? So like stuff needs to happen. Like decisions need to be made. People need to be added. Hours need to be changed. Like stuff needs to go. And there needs to be a people in place to execute on it. Like he has no integration. And we talk about traction a lot, but like that's a book you should read if this is a topic that interests you. Yeah. And I hope um, people are interested in the group practice model, like have enjoyed these, these two episodes, these two interviews with him. Cause, um, it's a really cool window into it. And I think a lot of like what you guys talk about is not something that's like you really get to have experience with until you're actually in it. So yeah, just, there's no way I would have known that I'd have these problems until I had these problems. <laughs> yeah. So like, that's why it's so valuable hearing about this. So you can like arm yourself with a little bit of that knowledge going into it. Um, but yeah, this, I mean, this wasn't my episode, but you know, I just still enjoyed it. I think, uh, you know, um, designing a leadership team is extremely high level thinking and it's, you know, getting it to be like one of the best offices out there. This yeah. is a big part and, of it. You know, he could easily go to 3 million with the proper infrastructure. Like he has a demand for it for sure. He just yeah. needs to execute operationally. I'm excited for him. Yeah, me too. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, this was a, a, again, probably my favorite. Mm, I don't know. If I'd say, yeah, it was my favorite one to do. The cool guy, cool practice, totally up my alley. I really had fun. So I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Uh, any questions, we're here available via email and our Facebook group. So, uh, And I'm on Instagram, so give me yeah, a follow. Yeah, he is. Killing it on Instagram. All right, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of Practice Underwater. We'll see you guys next week. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching with either Dr. George Hariri or Dr. Matt Garino, our contact emails are in the show notes. And if you're interested in being on Practice Underwater as a guest, where we can look at your practice anonymously, you can go ahead and contact the email in the show notes and follow those directions to get on the show. Thanks, and we'll see you guys next week on Practice Underwater.